So thank you all of you for coming and the people watching. Uh, I was going to make a joke of, about my last time here in the podium, which was an hour ago. Um, so I don't know if I'm more chill or a bit even more hyped. But the thing, well, since I believe most of you do not know me, I have to give some background history on it. Um, and also give some idea of what this talk is going to be about. Um, I'm, I have to say I'm more of a traveler than a photographer. Um, I started traveling before I started uh, doing photographs. And my trips and the photos I've made along the way have shifted what I used to do into what now I do. Um, Ten years ago, I was working on a nine to five job and on an ad agency back in Ecuador. Um, but when you work in advertising, it's never, never nine to five. So you usually stay up till 99, sometimes weekends. And it was pretty nice. It was interesting. It was definitely cre creative, but it didn't serve what, it, it didn't fulfill me uh, the way I'm, I kind of aim to or hope for, for it to be. Um, so I started traveling, but this is this comes later on. My first trip was solo trip, kind of 2001 with a friend. He was going to this law congress in Argentina, sorry, in Argentina, in Mendoza, and he asked me if I wanted to join him. I was without a job back then, you know, I was 20, 21. I said like, yeah, sure, why not? So we took. Lots of buses, and we rode through Peru and Chile, and ended up in Mendoza. Then we had a short trip to to Buenos Aires. This is way before me starting as a photographer. I think I had a disposable film camera back then, um, but that was kind of my first solo kind of trip, which I really enjoyed. You know, the backpacking one. Then I started having like a regular life, the, the advertising one. Um, but when I quit the, the agency, I started doing this business of mine um, that involved with 3D advertising. You know, the, the anaglyphs, uh, you use the red and, and cyan uh, glasses to see everything in 3D. And that required uh, of me to be very, uh, to give guidance to the photographer doing the, the photos for the magazine edition. So it really got me closer to photography. So when I started traveling after like, earning quite well after that, <laughs> that venture, I came to New York. And all that time, I just got a point and shoot. But afterwards, on my second trip, I was getting some film equipment for my brother. And I decided to get a, a DSLR for myself. And I just wanted to get like an old one just to test. And I, OK, I see I'm already supervising some photography. I just might try to get into some of it myself. But just about then, the D90, which is the first DSLR that had video, HD video even, uh, came out. So when I came and I asked, what, uh, I think I wanted to get like a D4 or something, and the guy in the counter said, like, don't do that, take this one. And sure, fair enough, good advice. So I, I got the camera and I started playing with it. And as I started traveling and playing with the camera, you know, just to make photos for, for myself and family and friends, people started asking me for photos. Um, I mean, I took a 20-month trip around Europe and then flew from Turkey to New York and then pretty much do a road trip all the way back to Ecuador. So when I came back to Ecuador, I had like this fair amount of debt, but also lots of people asking me for photos. So I already had like a way to sustain myself. So I started making photos mm, and paint. So, then the transition started, uh, but still, I'm still thinking of myself more of, 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 of a traveler than a photographer. Um, so this is a bit of what I do. This is um, in Ecuador. This was taken roughly about a month, month and a half ago. It's more of the type of traveling I do. I, I backpack a lot. Um, this is camping, which is you know, on car camping. Car carping, I don't know. Uh, just slept on the car and outside of the mountain. This is Cotopaxi, Cotopaxi volcano in Ecuador, and so it's this is more of the type of trips I enjoy. You know, getting in contact with nature, kind of getting away from the everyday life. Um, this is another type of photo. This is also in Ecuador, and 
procession. I'm trying to remember the name in English. It's just like this walk they do, they pray. Just trying to remember the word in English, but it just doesn't come to my mind. But I think these two photos, I'm going to talk about more on the techniques, uh, technical side of it, kind of define two different approaches to, to photography on travel, or different aspects of the same type of photography, which is the plan shot and the on the moment one, you know? Because if you see this one, you know, you you see it's a long exposure, so it's obviously a tripod set and it's very in the morning, so it needs more planning, and the other one is very um, on the moment shot. And me coming from Ecuador, which I don't know how many of you know anything about Ecuador. Um, Ecuador is the most biodiverse country per square meter in the world. Uh, so when I was traveling as a kid, I, I didn't even feel it was travel at all. For me, it was just, okay, let's go to the beach. Okay, let's, let's go to, the, to, to Quito, to, to the mountains, you know, and suddenly I'm flying from zero altitude to, I, know, I have no idea how many is in feet, and it's like 3,800 meters, no, 2,800 meters. And, and I, it's, it's, I know, it's just, I didn't feel like traveling at all. Uh, when I started traveling abroad and making way longer trips, I realized how lucky I was of seeing so, so many differences in such a small, small places. Then again, I uh, didn't have a camera back then, so most of this goes just on my memory, which is still good. So this is a bit of the travels I've done. This is in Venice Beach in Los Angeles, California. And this is a bit of a game I was doing with the colors and the shapes in Mexico. And the one with the wall and the seat, it's in Oaxaca, I believe, in San Cristobal de las Casas. And the one at the beach, it's in a place called Isla Mujeres. Um, this is traveling around Turkey, it's just walking while hitchhiking, just in the middle of nowhere. What I remember is there was a dry salt lake nearby and couldn't place it on a map. Oh, I have to look at the map, maybe I could. wouldn't remember the name of, if it has a name at all. Mm, this is in La Pedrera, Uruguay. Mm, beautiful place. I, funny thing is, I arrived here by chance. I was trying to get from Argentina, I arrived in Colonia, and I was trying to get to Montevideo, and I was hitchhiking, and I met this guy, he says that he, He's not going to Montevideo, but he's going to this place. And we started talking, and he was also a photographer. And then he tells me, oh, I'm going to sit with these people, this guy that is going to help me write a book. But I have a place in this other place where you can just crash if you want. And when we went to that place, um, the water um, fountain, uh, it's not a fountain, it's where you store the water, it, it broke. And it fell on the house, so the house was not a place to stay, so he said, join me to La Pedrera, and, and I was in this magnificent place, and just enjoying. So this is another thing I'm going to try to talk about, about the plant, the plant travel versus letting yourself be surprised and taken by, by the wind. Both of these shots are made in Uruguay. The one with the stones, it's called El Arbol de Piedra, the stone tree. It's in the Uyuni area. And the other one, with indigenous people, it's in Lake Titicaca, in La Isla del Sol. Another one from, from Bolivia, from the Uni area, the one with the car and the geyser, it's called, I believe it's Midnight Sun, it, the, the name of the place, if I don't remember. And the other one is in Ecuador, in Yasuní, uh, which is probably the most diverse area in, on, the, on the Amazon rainforest. It's a very small area, but it holds over 40% of all the diversity there is on the Amazon, which is fairly big. Um, when, I, when I said, when I wanted to talk about photography and travel, I, I think it's kind of narrowing too much, defining travel photography, because it's like narrowing down traveling, which is just such a broad set of experiences, and narrowing ourselves as photographers, because I think as photographers, professionally, one showcases a very particular branch of, the, of our work. But I think uh, as a photographer, like person-wise, we do so many things we don't ever showcase. So this is 
One is for um, a shot I did for a theater play, and the other one is part of um, a class I gave. These are both made in Antarctica, one of the sea elephants, and, and all the, the baby penguin, which is kind of funny because it gives the impression it just, it's, it's his first breath, but you know, probably it's been there for a few days. This is in Antarctica as well. It's a, it's a petrel, it's a very big bird. Very shy uh, with humans, but devastating with other penguins. This one can kill an, an adult penguin. You can, you can see that the pig looks fairly strong, like a submarine, hairy submarine. And this is in Guatemala. Um, these are some people I met along the way. Uh, this guy's from, from Germany, and we just team up for a bit. Funny thing is in Guatemala, I think there are only two banks. And if you have a credit card or a debit card, um, chances are that they will not work in one of them. And the, when, I, when I got to Guatemala, I came from, Bel from Belize by, um, by the water. I tried and it didn't work, so I, I ended up in this hostel um, that you can only access by water. So it was like, you, you wouldn't have ATMs there. Uh, and they were so used to it, so I was like, okay, don't worry, this is our bank account. Yeah. Whenever you have a chance, just, uh, just put the money in the bank. And you know it's funny how people end up trusting just somebody they just meet, and that's something some things I want to rescue about traveling and venturing yourself into the unknown. So that's a bit of what I do. Now let's see how it can work out for you as well. So why do we travel? Why do we photograph? And how do we mix them? Why do we travel? Is it do we travel for work, pleasure, out of curiosity? For who do we travel? For us, maybe it's for a client. Uh, who are we shooting these photos for? The same people? Uh, maybe for families, for friends. They just want to know where are we and we just stop, start making photos. Um, is it like a conscious shot or is it just something that we just want to show, showcase to show the immediacy of our surroundings? Mm. And coming back to the thing, what is travel photography and if it can be so simply defined? Um, I mean, coming to think, what, what's a travel photography? You, you make portraits, you see places, you get into adventures. You can be, actually I have a friend here, uh, her husband once took me rock climbing in Chile and I was uh, shooting a rock climbing experience. Uh, but it's also making portraits in the jungle. It's, it's something that happened to me in Mexico. I was traveling, uh, backpacking, almost the end of the trip. I've already been traveling for over a year. Uh, so I had no budget and I remember I had a blog that back then, and I went to this Photoshop, um, put a photo of me, wrote about my blog a bit, make, like, make an ID of my own blog. It's very pretentious on my side, but I went to the Arena Mexico, uh, where they have wrestling in Mexico City, and told them I was writing for, my, for, for this blog, which is my blog. Um, <laughs> and yeah, they were, they were, they were telling me, yeah, now you should like, press, you should get like a week in advance. And I said, like, I, I can't, I arrived yesterday, I'm leaving tomorrow to made up a place in Mexico. And after a few talks, I was photographing wrestling in Mexico and getting on the backstage, you know, like uh, with the wrestlers and everything. So it, even ph photography can be a key to different places. It's, it's an, ex an excuse that sometimes allows you to break some barriers that you might not do otherwise. So, so yeah, you can be photographing. Breast, yeah, <laughs> so you can photograph in wrestling. You can be, as I've as I been, like, feeling the solitude or the harshness of Chernobyl, like the crazy vibes of New York or the peacefulness in Antarctica. So, so it's not so easily defined because you get all this range of topics and things you see because traveling is it's opening yourself to different experiences where it's a party, like a festival, or going deep into somebody's, some hermit's house in the middle of nowhere. So it's not so easily to, to, to grasp, I guess, as a concept. So it drives me to another question. And it's, it's like, we make photos while we travel, or we travel to make photos? And there's a thing about the purpose. And coming back to the question, why, why do we travel for? 
or training for ourselves, for a client, and, and all of this will affect our outcome. Uh, there's this writer that said, that said that a journey is best measured in friends rather than in miles. And this leads me to associating it for with photography is that we photograph the things we love. And by love, I don't only mean the platonic love, but also the understanding. Or how do you, how do, how does somebody or some place reaches you? How some experience fulfills you, and how you approach this type of experiences. Um, so I think that's a bit of trouble. Like it's jumping into the unknown and embracing it. Um, then again, the, uh, also doing some planning is good. Um, but for me, travel, travel photography in general, it's our personal tale. What are we? how we are writing our, our, our own history. And there's a funny thing, you know, everybody knows the word photography that comes from the Greek photos, which means graph, graphe, graphe, which is translated to drawing and light, you know. A, no, sorry, photo, photo, photo is, is light and graph, graphe, is, uh, yeah, graphe, graphe is, is drawing. But there's also this other translation of graphe, which is writing. And sometimes I like to think of photography more than drawing with pictures, like writing with pictures. It's, it's very different, it's very similar, but it just twists on the perception can also help you get a better narrative, I think. Um, so talking about personal life, this is a portrait I shot in Syria. And this is another other thing about photography and traveling it's, it's the fleeting moments and how they affect you. And, and the power, even, they have to affect you after uh, you, you, you took them. Uh, for instance, when I, when I made this photo in Syria, I was just having a ball, laughing with some kids. Seeing this photo almost 10 years later, after all the things that have happened, its meaning has changed so much. So, so that's, that's something, about, I, I have no idea whatever happened to this child. Um, I hope with all my heart that he's, he's all right, but th the thing is, it, it haunts you in a, in a different way. And I think that's, that's a power of photography of just perpetuating a moment, and which you grow on, but also allows you to come back to this very same moment which you remember and see with different eyes. And, I don't know, like self-feeding itself and, and, and growing for me, meaning for you and even for others. So is, is it what we see or is it photography is the way we translate what we see? And this is a portrait of the chef when I was in Antarctica. And it was very funny because when I was, when I was in Antarctica, um, I had to share the, the common space with all the people that were there. and. And if I, if I didn't grab a hold of the computer, they would just put lots of pretty much the same two CDs of music all the time, which would drive me crazy. So I decided after a day of shooting, I would just make a slideshow uh, while we were eating and showcase the photos that I've been taking ever, uh, so far. And in the meantime, I'll just put my playlist, which is very good. But when this photo came out, um, the photo, I, I saw the chef, the chef sorry. I, I saw him and he, and he made this very weird expression that he really despised the photo. I said like, ooh, everybody loved it except him. And, and so I, after a while I approached him and said like, what happened? Do you like the photo? And he said, yeah, yeah, come on. What happened? I saw, I saw your face and he's like, well, that's not me. Because he was a very cheerful guy. He was like, yeah, all the time and just laughing. And so I told him, yeah, that's not you. But that's something you can be, you could be. Because I, I was, as a, on my set of portraits, I was a, aiming for a very solemn look. I wanted to look ageless, and like it could be taken in 1850, I guess, or any, any other time, but you have the same feel to it. Uh, it's all natural light and stuff. Um, so it was very interesting to, when I explained him that this is, that photography is not a way to capture a reality on its own. It's a way to see reality through one's eyes. And, and after a while, he, he, he really is like dug, dug the, the whole concept, and he, he loved it. He's like, oh, now I see. And it was one of the two most shocking experiences I have with explaining about the photographic uh, process to people that are not related to it. Another one was in the jungle, 
uh, when I was working with some people uh, doing some construction there. And, and he was telling me a story about ghosts and everything. I said, like, OK, I'm going to show you something. So I, I put the tripod. No, actually, I, I don't think it, that's where it started. I, I wanted to show him how to do light painting. So I, I put the camera on a tripod, and I show him the techniques. And afterwards, he was like, um, oh. So whenever you see like a ghost photo, like those are shows, like it, it means it can be faked. It, he, he was not aware of it. He, he comes from a very different background than and as I do, or maybe most of us do. So, so he, he, through photography, learning the process, he started being more skeptical about the things he sees. It's it's interesting how it can affect your uh, your vision on the things you're shown. So it can be a mean uh, in which we teach as well. So this is in Cappadocia and Urgup, amazing place in Turkey. Um, my, my plan was never to become a photographer. I just wanted to travel and learn a bit more about what's outside, sharing uh, what, whatever I see. Uh, but the thing is, well, 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 the more I travel, the more I, the more I learn. And the more, it's not I learn, it's I'm being taught in different ways. So it's the least fair thing I could do is try to share this as well. So that's this talk is about about it, uh, about the things I've learned on and what I've been taught and how can I use it to enrich somebody's life as mine has been enriched. Um, knowing that not everybody has been bold enough to jump into the unknown. Just does take uh, a bit of courage, I guess. So this is the art of traveling, and hence the subtitle, and developing as a photographer. What I did. So the thing things, um, or a good guidance, is the preparation to do before uh, a trip or a shoot. Sorry. Uh, so th let's make something very basic. Let's go do a trip to the beach, which is very close here. I mean, we have, we have two, right? We have the Rockaways and the other place. I forgot right now the name, which is Long Beach. Yeah, Long Beach. <laughs> no, the one with the Coney. theme park, Coney Island. It's such a weird place <laughs> for me. I, I, I lived on, the, on, a, on a beach for, for one year, and then I, I'm there, and it's a, it's a theme park here. It's, anyway, so if, if we're, most of us know a bit what, what, what we're going to expect on a beach trip, right? Uh, you know, okay, what are we, what, what are we gonna see? Um, what, what moments are we expecting to have? Are we gonna be there by dawn, by dusk? Are we gonna be there at night? Is it gonna be, I don't know, are we gonna see stars? Is it gonna be cloudy? So you can make a list of the things you hope or aim to get from that place as a photo. Uh, what else? Uh, portraits. What, what can we do as portraits? We have fishermen, we have, sh we have the surfers, maybe people selling ice cream or whatever, you know, food, etc. Activities, are we going with friends? Are we gonna cook? Are we gonna be surfing? Are we going fishing? Are we going trekking? What are we gonna do there that can be documented, that it's interest, uh, in the interest of our story to tell? Details. Uh, Again, the food, I'm very food biased. Uh, the local fauna, uh, is, is it the sand? Uh, what type of sand does the beach have? Is it, is it white sand? Is it gray sand? Is it black sand? Is it pink? Or like this place in Big Sur, which is the Pebble Beach. So, so you, you, do, you do a bit of research and think of a way of getting the most for your, for your tell. Um, I think I, this probably should have been in another moment, but this is how to travel better and have better experiences and images. Um, as everything, it depends on you, on your goals, on how do you travel, what do you expect to get? Mm. Are you gonna be, I don't know, like an off, off the beaten track type of traveler? Um, or are you gonna do food traveling? Is it gonna be street food? Is it gonna be high-end food? Are you gonna go to restaurants? Are you gonna go to five, five, five stars hotels? Are you gonna be camping? So all of this, uh, we're gonna figure how you uh, have better experiences. But there's one thing that they all share. It's whenever you're going to some place, so you have to try to meet the locals. 
the locals have the know-how. The locals are the one from there, and and the locals will tell you things that are not in a guidebook. And so that way your experience, even if it's not as magnificent as the one in the, in the guidebook, it's going to be very original, very very unique to you, and and from a fresh perspective, you're not going to repeat what has been done several times. You might still do it, but you're going to come with fresh eyes. These are a few of the things I use to travel. There are plenty more. Craigslist. I know Craigslist as a photographer is not the place to go unless you want to find all sorts of crazy things and post. Uh, but for instance, I use Craigslist. Uh, how long was this ago? Maybe it was seven years ago, I think, or three years ago, um, to do a trip uh, from from New Jersey to San Francisco by car. I go, went to Reicher and and found found these people, these two friends that were driving all the way there, and and already a dog have joined them. I mean, somebody wanted to send uh, her dog to Utah. So there were already three passengers, and then I joined in. So there were three of us and a dog. And we, all we have to do was share the expenses, share the gas. And then I had this amazing road trip across America um, from the east to the west coast. That's pretty cool. And the other one is Hitch Wiki. The, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term Wiki, and probably will, most people will think of Wikipedia, uh, which is this kind of system where the users can enter information about their experiences, uh, there, there's a set of values, uh, evaluation, and so, so it stays longer, and it stays confirmed. So for instance, Hitch Wiki has information about the states as a whole, every state legislation. There are in some states here, for instance, that you are not allowed to do hitchhiking. There are some places where you are allowed to do it in certain places, and in some places you are pretty much free to do it. There's a rating on how the people react to hitchhikers. Are they going to throw a bottle on you? Are they going to pick you up? Are they going to be friendly? Are they going to probably give you money f for you to keep going next time? It's crazy. Like there's l People will tell their tales, and they will make a database out of it. Like, I use this to hitchhike all over Europe. And I remember uh, I one tried, once tried to use it in Ecuador, and they say like hitchhiking there is super easy, which it is. But most people do not do it because the buses are so cheap, which they also, they also are. And so, yeah, couch surfing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with couch surfing. It's, it's a social network like Facebook when you make a profile out of yourself, you know, like, hi, I'm Enrique, I'm from Ecuador, I've traveled a lot of countries, I like photography, I like rock climbing, I like surfing, etc. These are the books I read in the last few years, blah, blah, blah. You, 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 you make a profile out of yourself. And you looked into other people's profile. Uh, I would say I'm a traveler, and let's say you, for instance, are a host at the, at the current time. So hey, I saw your I saw your profile. I, I've seen you. You've traveled way more than I have. I, I, I'm really interested in meeting you. Uh, can can I crash your place? And sometimes they will say yes. Sometimes they'll they'll say no. Sometimes they have a couch. Sometimes they have a whole room. And sometimes they will just meet for coffee. Sometimes you will just go to a party together. But it's, it's a very interesting way of meeting, like I said before, local people. I, I've, I have couch surfers taking me to, I don't know, scuba diving or crazy restaurants and something that is very unique to them, to their own lifestyle. Because you get to uh, enjoy people's lifestyles as well. Facebook, of course, the biggest social network. It's, it's good to keep in touch with the people you've met while traveling because memory and faces and emails and they don't usually mix well and 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 sometimes it's, a, it's the best way to keep track of whoever you met on the way because you see their photos you see what they've been doing you see where they are and and it's a way to promote coincidences so I, I've been here and then I see a friend, oh, you're here too? Okay, let's meet. And I, there, are, there are people I met in three, four countries already because we keep in touch. But we don't, we don't write emails all the time because it's too, too time consuming. And Instagram, this is also to, to see places. You can look ahead. You can 
I was going to say Google, but not. Uh, you can just search for a place and you will see lots of images. Maybe that will serve as an inspiration for you to go and get uh, photos of the same place. So you can post and people will share your photos. It also allows you to promote yourself, your, your work. So yeah, uh, I mean, there are so many of them. Uh, it's impossible to list them all, but these are very good. And they have served me more than well for lots of travelings. So, oh, this is also good. This I started doing recently. Um, contact a hostel or hotel. Restaurants serve as well. In this case, I, I put hostel first because it's easier. Usually hostels are family, friends managed. Instead of a hotel, it tends to be more corporate. So there are more less steps on the ladder, so you can get in touch easier. For instance, a um, few months ago, I went to this place called Baños in Ecuador. Um, and I saw this hostel was trying to make a raffle on it. And he was, they were trying to sell it, but they decided to go on the, the, the raffle way, so people just make bids, and then somebody will get, might get a, ho a hostel just by betting $25, which is good. And, but they had these photos that were subpar. So I, I called them and contacted them and said, like, hi, I noticed you're, you're doing this for your ho hostel. Um, this is my job. This is what I do. I think you can be doing so much better. Uh, I can go to, to Baños, and we can, we can see around. You can take me to what's more attractive in Baños, restaurants, uh, adventures, and, and your hostel, of course. And, and then I make a video of it. So I, I went there. I already had a place to stay. And at no cost, of course. Uh, we went, we, ha we had all the tour, and then go to the waterfall, let's go canopy, let's go to this restaurant, blah, 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 everything. And, and had a great experience. And in the end, it was a profitable experience because I did charge for, 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 for the video. And so it made my travel very entertaining and very uh, sustainable because you still need money. And, so yeah, you can do the same with restaurants. The thing is, now with social media, everybody can reach thousands of people right away. But not everybody has, uh, it's, has the marketing mentality yet. So as a restaurant, I mean, like of course, like McDonald's will hire this amazing photographer and make one photo and put it in millions of restaurants. Yeah, it's like, but if I have my own restaurant, I'll have, my, I'll have myself as a photographer, of course, but but if I needed photos, I'm not, I'm not aware of it because, but I can promote it on Facebook, Instagram, and reach thousands of people. And if all, uh, all I do is take a not good photo with a crappy cell, maybe, and maybe I can negotiate with, with, with the re this restaurant and say, like, look, I'll make these photos. They, they, they will go on, on this budget. And I'll share some of them on my own network. And, and you get to uh, rise up the bar a bit. So that works. So another tip is wake up early. That's, that's when the magic happens lots of times and when there's nobody, or usually there's not that many people there to, to step in front of it. For instance, that photo in San Francisco, in case you didn't recognize the place, <laughs> and I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning to get that photo because yeah, I was roughly taken at 5, 5.30 a.m. So I, and I had to get a few cars and cross there and find a place, you know, because, yeah, one, one, one thing is to get there just in time, but you have to get before that to actually f find your framing. Mm. And the other one is in Bolivia, in, in Titicaca. Mm. It's also around 5, 6 a.m. top, now probably like 5.30. And the women were taking out the potatoes from the ground. Maybe a few hours later, they, they'll finish. So waking up very early does have its benefits. Mm, this is another thing about composing your frame. And there's, there's a photographer, I forgot his name. He said, you have to, to hunt for the picture. And hunting, you know, when somebody's hunting, it's just waiting for the most part. And like if you're a tiger and you just have to sneak in and wait till, I uh, have no idea how you call that in, in English, but you have to wait till your prey is near so you can jump on it, right? So for instance, in this photo, which I'm pretty sure everybody will guess is in Cuba, I already had the framing that I wanted. And I saw the 
pink columns with the striking blues and yellows and and all the ornaments with the with the trash bag over there and the gray from the streets and I thought uh, it would be amazing if just somebody steps right in that part of the frame. So I was staying there, not that long, I'm not that patient, but I was there for a few minutes, no, probably about, about a minute, like five, six people passed before. But when this woman passed, which she had like, the perfect look because she had a very bright blue bag that m blends well with the, with the background, and, and she just made this stroll long steps and it just hit the perfect moment. But uh, I couldn't have gotten it if I just not, was not waiting for it. The same with, with the other photo. Um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of lucky as well. I, I couldn't expect for the, ki for the kid to fall. But I was already framing the picture, trying to think of what is being an elder person against like the very youthful ones. They were just playing on the swing. And the funny thing is, uh, at some moment, the kid falls. And this guy that had a grumpy face two frames before just burst into laughter. And I managed to click on the right moment because I was prepared. So it's, that's another thing. That's why preparation is very important. Um, then there's the challenge yourself. I say you have to challenge yourself physically, creatively, and socially. Mm. For the Star Trail photo, I, this is in Casitagua, close to Quito in Ecuador. That was more of a physical challenge because I was not prepared for how cold it was going to be that night. And I was so tempted to go back into the car and just hide from it. Uh, but I decided to take it as it come and hold myself a bit longer and made those, those photos. And it paid, I guess. Um, the one, the portrait of that guy, um, was more of a creative and social challenge. Uh, this was while making photos of the cocoa plantations in Dominican Republic. And I was meeting with this guy, which had a very pinkish tone to his skin. And I wanted to make a portrait of him, but I really wanted to mix him with the environment. And there were um, different walls I can put him against, or different environments, trees, and everything. But I was trying to mix him with the, with the beans to get a sense of what he's doing or who he is, and also with whatever, like, uh, culture-wise. Um, so I, I, luckily, I stumbled into this pinkish wall as well that resembled pretty much his skin tone. And with the cocoa beans, and I think it made a very peaceful composition because it's, the colors are very monotone, eh, monotonal, I guess. And, and yeah, and then directing him into posing in a proper way that it feels natural on him, but doesn't feel too static. And the one on the bottom right, this is something I did eh, last year when there was an, eco an, an earthquake in Ecuador, and there was this NGO and that was doing these, how do you call those, but water towels? And so people can shower, clean themselves, and everything. And this, this type of photo, of course, it do, do, doesn't only have like aesthetic purpose, but these are photos from that NGO, so you also have to be like a commercial uh, purpose that attract donors and help sell their, their, their work. So for me, it was very interesting to see what they document, not only what they do, but how it affects the people. So whenever I'm thinking that photo, I'm arranging the, wa the, the water tower with somebody using the water, in this case, this girl, cleaning. And I have to wait uh, while she was um, doing the dishes until somebody from that NGO just went and used the pump as well. So you get the branding. So you got the whole story in, in one. You, you see what they're doing, you see who is doing it, and you see for whom and for what. So, so that's, that's the thing about trying to add content to your photography, which is the most important thing. Mo most striking photographies uh, are the ones that tell more than one story. 
for instance, this is a photo from, from where I used to live. Uh, it's called Ayampe in Ecuador. And there are so many stories in this photo. Uh, you can see, of course, it's a beachfront. There's no doubt on that one. You can see the, that there's an island on the background. Um, that tells you a bit about the ge geographical qualities of the place. But there's also the most striking blue wave. So if you, if you know about, about biology and everything, you might know that this uh, particle I believe called Noctilucas, which is this type of bacteria I believe that plankton feeds upon. But when it's shaking, by, yeah, when it's shaking, it creates bioluminescence. So the wave is breaking, and then you get this amazing blue whale. But this was roughly just a bit after sunset. So you still have the sunset colors that they carry this gradient on the background. And as you can see, the sky is pretty clear in Ayampe because it's, it's, not even, it's not even complete night, and you already see the sky is full of stars. So you have all the stories in one photo. Let's talk a bit about gear, which is, lots of people love the gear part. OK, let me see. This is my regular setup. And this is probably one of the most important accessories you can have for photography. This is a, tri this is a tripod. This is carbon fiber, which is, makes everything a bit more easy on your back. It's always good to have a book. Yeah. What is it? It's a book. It's just a book. What are you reading? Uh, this is Seven Days in the Art World. Uh, art World. An action cam. And this is my current weapon of choice. It's simple, simple camera. I'm doing more video. This is an accessory for the tripod. This is a Leon cube light. This can even go underwater to 30 meters. Charger for the camera, cell phone, whatever you need. Mm. What I think is the, m this is the best. This is the cheapest thing you can buy and helps the most when you're changing lenses. All the dust that gets in your sensor, just remember to get one with the valve on the back so you don't, are not having the same dirty air you're, gonna try, you're trying to clean. Mm. I'm shooting lots of video nowadays and this is extremely important for video. This is a microphone with a dead cat. And the dead cat is just for when it's windy, you don't get the, the air blowing in your sound. And it's funny about sound because you can see a very bad image with good sound, but it's very hard to stand a good image with bad sound. You can see a film from last century, and if it has clean audio, you will enjoy it. You can see a 4K video, and if it has crappy audio, you will turn it off right away. Nobody wants to hear static. Extra lens, it's an old one. Macro adapters, some business cards, which I should have said, lots of these they are spread all over. These are also very handy, and this is an ND filter, which is good for making long exposures on daytime. Um, and also when you're filming, it allows you to use a wider aperture and do not blow up the image. Um, this is a polarizer, which helps create uh, more blue skies and eliminate reflections. So, so that's pretty much it here. I'm just going to leave that open. And since I'm doing lots of video nowadays, I also carry one of these, which is a Mavic drone, which is super cool. Unfortunately, you cannot fly it in New York. That's something I'm going to mention soon. It's forbidden 99.8% of New York. So here, I, like, if I want to get lots of perspective, I already have covered air, um, land, and water. So it's minimal gear. You still get to cover lots of range. Just, oh, forgot about it. Gear-wise, for me, the most, kind of the most important thing is this. Oh, this, by the way, I want to tell you a story about this backpack. Oh, sorry about the microphone. Is that it has a belt. Because 
you don't want to carry all that weight in your shoulders and the hips are stronger so it's, it's way better this camera is so this backpack is so beaten up and um, once I was traveling and that's another thing you should never be too confident with your with your gear I asked a friend uh, that if he can help me just put in the, the backpack um, on the back of the car because I was uh, on the, just on the back seat because I was driving for some reason he thought I said put the backpack on the roof of the car <laughs> so a hundred kilometers per hour that's roughly 60 miles per hour later somebody said something very expensive just flew out of the car <laughs> and it was this backpack with my camera and lenses on it but get good gear nothing happened to them um, I mean something with the CD but I wasn't using CDs for ages, so it didn't really bother me, but it's good to protect your gear. What brand is it tried by? Uh, that's Sirui. But we're going to uh, do the questions at the end, oh. so we can. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, nowadays I'm looking more for fanny packs and something I can just keep on my um, waist that will also give me easy access because it's kind of a burden just to take everything out and reach for the pockets and. So um, backpack-wise, I think I'm going to change this soon to get into more modular things. Oh, this is where I store my laptop as well. And now I'm going to just use mostly pouches and just store them in regular backpacks. The thing about regular backpacks is they're less suspicious. So when you're traveling like, in different places where they're not so safe, it's better to have your gear look like it's not gear. So I just travel with a regular backpack, and I'm just another dairy backpacker. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's a good tip on backpackers, and, uh, which I forgot to say when I spoke in Spanish. It's always good to be clean when you are hitchhiking. It's because in the end when you're asking for a ride and somebody is letting enter the, your, their car, it's like entering somebody's ho home. And it's kind of the minimum of respect to be as presentable as possible. I mean, there, there, there are cases where you cannot avoid being dirty and sweaty, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's a good advice for every backpacker out there. And you get more rights that way as well. Don't overdo it. Nobody's going to pick up a guy in a suit doing this on the highway. That's freaking creepy. Um, yeah, that's not going to happen. And so yeah, but the gear, every, uh, the gear I take usually relies on, or depends on different things. My time of traveling, my type of traveling, the purpose of it, the budget, and what I expect to get, the tone of the images I uh, expect to get. Uh, for instance, now that I'm doing uh, light photography, most photos for myself, I don't mind using a kit lens. Whereas if it was for a, a client, I might get back to my primes, which have more sharpness. And the image quality overall, it's, it's crispier, crispier and nicer. Um, also, the time and type is if I'm going is if I'm gonna be climbing a mountain. I, I want to be light. I want to be. I want, I want to be able to climb it, not just stay in the middle and say, "Okay, I'm exhausted." Also, I should have added, "Where are you going?" And right now, I'm in New York. If I if I go out on a on a day trip, I'm not gonna take the drone because I'm I'm not gonna fly it. So everything changes depending on what you're gonna do. Um, and the purpose, and I, I don't think I, I don't think most people will. I mean, sure there are cases, but for the most part, you wouldn't be shooting uh, street photography with a telephoto lens because you have to be too far away from the action, um, or you you will not go on a safari with a wide-angle lens because you don't want to be this close to the lion. It's kind of not too smart. <laughs> so, for instance, when I went to Antarctica in which I knew it was going to be very cold, and I was not going to be able of changing lenses um, because of the condensation. I might just uh, destroy the sensor and just mess up the camera. I had to take different cameras. So I had, I had like three cameras, and the action plan, point and shoot. And it was very unpractical for me to take a light stand, an umbrella, and a flash. So you have to think of where are you going, especially when you're taking a 150 to 500 lens, which is like this big, and yeah. So you have to think of where are you going, how are you going, what are you going to do, 
I mean, maybe, maybe you have, if I had in Antarctica somebody, like an assistant, just carrying all the weight for me, like yeah. super strong guy, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, yeah, it's good. <laughs> but no, that was not the case. Um, another thing, oh, this is in, oh, I forgot to translate that. Well, estado de rodillas y espalda, it means like the state of your knees and back. And so you have to add all this. This is, by the way, a very uh, self-made and not very scientific equation I just made. So, <laughs> so yeah, you have to add all those things and then divide it on how are your knees and how is your back. Because, yeah, you, you, you need to strengthen those if you're going to do it, if you're going to take lots of weight. So yeah, on that, fanny packs, backpacks, and like I said, pouches. Always important to get to have spare batteries, um, SD cards, the chargers, and lots of backup. I don't have it right here, but I have two, four terabytes hard drives uh, where I'm staying right now, and I also have one in Ecuador, which has all the photos I had until I left. So, because and when I travel, I have one hard one hard drive with me, and another in my second backpack. Um, that usually goes on the truck of the car or whatever. So if anything happens, there is more chance that one of them stays with me. And so it's just safety. This was shot here mm, three years ago. I decided, oh, I, I, I was here for Halloween. And I decided I just wanted to have some, some portrait shots. And I had pretty much, well, same backpack set up, I just tied everything on the back. I had a light stand, um, speed light, and a small collapsible um, softbox. And of course, a piece of black cardboard, and that was pretty much the set of it. And, and for instance, this is in Pillaro, in Ecuador, which is very funny. They, they have this thing called the, Las Diabladas de Pillaro, the Devils of Pillaro. Um, which is this party they do. The oranges are very, I'm not saying uncertain, but very colorful because everybody has a different story. But the thing <laughs> is they dress themselves like devils, supposedly to scare people from other, from other villages to approach them, fight them, uh, take their women back in the day. And they will get insanely drunk. Um, you know, it's a party. <laughs> And, and you're dressed as a devil. I mean, you, you cannot expect not to get drunk. And they will hit each other with whips, like, like really badly. There's blood, and and you, you all become friends because you share the same blood, I guess. Now, now, now it's more touristy friendly, I guess. And they don't, you don't see that much of a blood spill anymore. But still pretty fun. And I'm bringing this because of the different setup I, I had for this. For this, I, was, I think I, I was only using my 50. So it's a completely different approach, because I, I, I wanted to be more spontaneous about the show. I, I, I was not going to set up a small studio in the, in the middle of the street. I was just going to be moving from place to place, digging, dodging bottles of alcohol and whips, maybe, I don't know, and, and crazy people, and people on the ground you have to jump. And you know, you have to prepare for what you're going to encounter. Whereas for this is rock climbing trip, and ideally I didn't have it on this particular trip. I, I was too heavy on this one, but nowadays I will definitely take my drone, uh, take an action cam, and it will make it way easier because that's not an easy climb, and I had to climb all the way up there uh, to get my gear and be able of shooting from above. And the photos didn't come out that well because it's frightening to be just holding yourself from a rope and managing a big camera that you don't want it to fall. Freezing a bit because it was kind of cold up above. And when, you're, when you're not rock climbing anymore, you're just like feeling the, feeling the coldness and trying to balance yourself because I had to go like, go like it would be easier if I had like smaller and uh, lighter gear. But, but yeah, so yeah, I usually need to prepare this way. Like I'm, I'm saying like if, you, if, if, you're just, if you're gonna photograph the best restaurants around the world, you probably need a completely different setup. 
um, on non photographic items, I would say like zip lock bags are the best. And once I was crossing from Panama to Colombia by speedboats, very nice. But we got hit by a wave and I got soaked, which is all right. But the thing is, my passport got soaked. And then I had lots of trouble trying to get a stamp entering Colombia because they said, like, this passport is wrecked. Yeah, so like, dude, I just came here by speedboat. Yeah. So, yeah. Then uh, multi purpose uh, tools like Swiss Army knives, and there are m many other out there. Credit cards, debit cards, lot of singles. Because uh, having like big bills in some places is just a no no. I know in Ecuador, 95% and just, I'm just making random numbers um, of places will not take a 50 or $100 bills. So, and especially if you're doing stuff in the, in the street and you just made a portrait of somebody and they ask you for a dollar and you only have a 20, uh, you're giving them the 20 or you might get a very grumpy face. So, so yeah, I also say that the most important item of course is a smile and just be charming with everybody and you, I mean, it takes you, it takes you. Oh, am I? Oh, this is the story. I'm. I think I translated this. I'm just. I, I had a presentation in Spanish before, so the translation might be a bit awkward. So this is the story, and how we're gonna approach it. Are we gonna be creative or reactive? What I mean between a creative versus reactive approach. The reactive ap approach might be comparable with the one from the street photographer. He's always hunting for moments, and when he anticipates them, and or she, and just clicks on the right moment. Whereas the creative one, it's more like a painter. He has this image in his head, or her head, I'm just talking his, because me. Uh, and then you, you recreate it, like a fashion model will do. You know, okay, I want this prop, I want this style, I want this, uh, so you elaborate on it. And of course, there's all these different tones in the middle in which you create a bit of both. Um, but that's something to consider when the type of photography you're gonna do. These are the ones I mentioned before. I couldn't have planned. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be practical for me to shoot, I guess, like a street thing with a light. And with her, I, I saw her before, if I, if I remember correctly, and I knew I wanted to get a photo of her eyes through the veil. Um, but it had to be like spontaneous. So the thing I did was just pretty much just keep on focus and, and follow her, follow her until she noticed somebody was just following her footsteps and she stared at me and the moment I clicked, so I was preparing for it. Whereas in the other, I actually had a friend that was tra traveling, this is in the Yasuni again, and I was traveling with a friend and I asked him to hold this light stand and with a speed light and, uh, and a softbox on it and just give him this light on his face and his shoulders so he pops out from, from the background a bit more. Very subtle, and most people will never guess there's, there's a light over there, but it's a different approach, and it's the same. It's all the different nuances on travel photography, which can be very similar and, and different at the same time. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with this. I thought I translated. I, th I think I, I had a problem with the saving because I, I literally translate every slide. So I feel so bad now. But this is about the visual narrative. Luckily, that's a very, very simple word. So I don't think it's that hard. And it's to write or not to write. There is the question, kind of. Um, for instance, this photo was shot in Antarctica. And if you look at the photo, it might, may or may not have a meaning for you. May, you may, and whenever I look at it, I find it very tranquilizing. But the container in the middle really strikes me. It pops out and it breaks a bit because you have the blue tones and there's this red box and everything is very natural and this is very square. And you might think of it in any way you like. And, but the thing is, when you add a word, how it can mean be altered or enhanced. This is Jim. Now, yeah, I, I saw lots of reactions to your faces. Now, now you're thinking, oh, is that the gym? Yes, it was the gym. And the gym, it's mm, probably from here to that wall, 
just about this size. It's not that big of a gym. And it really gives you um, a deeper feeling into what's like to live in Antarctica, for instance, and oh, for, for us in that particular expedition. Uh, so it can add a lot of, the, of, of meaning to that image. It, so that's, that's a thing of where you want to aim your photo, photographic work to and where you want to take it. And of course, the more you talk about it, you can deepen the, image, the, the meaning. Then again, you can also take away some of the mystery of it. So it's a balance and uh, you must measure. Now, as the story goes, there are, I think, more or less four or five type of shots that are required to tell a tale, um, which is the white shot, uh, as I was saying before in the previous talk. If I, if I make a photo of this wall, uh, nobody will know it's on B&H. Right? There's, there's no reference. If I, if I go, if I do the same with the chairs, nobody will know. Um, unless you are a very connoisseur of the <laughs> chairs on B&H. But if I go outside and I make this white shot and I show where the, the, the shop is located, the streets nearby, the movement around it, you'll get more of an idea of where I'm shooting. So that will be like a, a general shot. And the detail, what's important on a story, what's, what's something that strikes about it. Um, and the portrait, because I think most, most of the stories revolve around human nature in the end, because we, we are well turning the stories to ourselves or to our similars. And so I think that's, that's very important. The action, it's what's happening, and the most important thing that happens in a place or in your story. And the iconic shot, something you want to explode, like stand out from the whole story. Sometimes they mix. Um, I'm, and then, like I said before, um, the richer a photo is, I mean, it has more meaning, so they will overlap lots of, lots of times. But like a wide general shot, this could be one of them. This is in a place called Tangan in Ecuador. I have another one, tell the tale, get good reference. It's a good perspective of the, of the height of the wall made of the surroundings. So you, the, the general will give you an idea as to where we are. Where a detail is more of what goes on there as well. Is These are the best potatoes I've ever tried. <laughs> Literally, the most simple ones and the best by far. And I've tried lots of potatoes. There, there, there are about, I think, I hope I'm not exaggerating, but I think there's about a hundred, a thousand different types of potatoes in Ecuador. I have no idea what this kind is. I just remember, I think you're gonna see uh, there's, there's something coming about this trip. But I think it's the kind and also the other kind, I mean, wh where it was grown, because this is in the middle of nowhere and somebody's property and he probably took those potatoes out in the morning and just boiled them in the afternoon. And, and the, the taste of it was just amazing. Um, the portraits, these are the guys. You see again, this is a, this, these are two different type of portraits. Here you can feel like and there's more on them, on their relationship. Whereas this one shows her in her environment. You can tell that she's a hardworking woman. She's holding a machete in a very thick forest. So she's the one guiding us. And these are the rock climbers, which I'm gonna, which I'm joining. This is can be the action shot, as well as this, because there's some, uh, there's something going on. Oh, this one, it's a more complete story. And this can be an iconic shot, one that stands out and creates a, a whole different story. Then again, as I said, sometimes they overlap. This could be the iconic shot too. So how do we use them? Oh, um, yeah, it's again in Spanish. So yeah, you have the general, the wide angle, for maybe, on just something that gives you a sense of where, where are we? You have the detail, in this case, the preparation of the food. Then, I mean, I had lots more photos, just putting these ones as an example. Then you have a series of portraits and the action. 
and iconic shots and how do you mix them will create a story. Even with the same photos, if you mix them differently, they will create completely different stories. So this is an example. That's the signature and the portrait and the detail <coughs> and the action and the, where, where everything was developed. On a different scenario, this can be the iconic shot. And this can be the other ones. You have a sense of where you are, what's there. Uh, the, the detail, in this case, they mix because the detail might be the sea elephant, where the action is the, the newborn kind of, and the portrait. And if we change different photos from the same series, kind of, now it changes the meaning as well. This, in, in this one, we change, up and I completely avoided all the animals and everything and just focus on the people. And now you have a sense of where they are, how did they move, and you know, this is, you see the speedboats, how much they're covered, and the samples they're taking, so you, you can have a feel that they're doing some, some research and a portrait. And of course, again, the thing that you shot. Or, back again with the same one, just trying to keep it the same, the same photos we saw before, and now it's a completely different story. Now you're focused on the, the signature show will be the detail show that was before. And when you have the food and it tells you more about the, the localness of the place, I guess. And I don't know if localness is a, is a word, but I think you know what I mean. Or in this case. Este es un local, está increíble, está muy especial. Este está. It, it takes you. It takes you. It's just so magical. Magical is the word of thing. It just takes you in. Un lugar lo mejor de Ecuador. Sí. Sí, verdad. We're making a, a small Spanglish documentary now. <laughs> yeah. That's okay because the gringos need to see it in Estados Unidos. Yeah, okay. We have, okay. And the subtitles are going to be a bitch, though. <laughs> we need better music. Pero necesitamos música mejor. So, how long do we get there? An hour? It's like one hour to the turnoff, and then like an hour and a half from the, the highway to the super. It's a party here, man. I don't see it. Should we crash? Should we crash? <laughs> Let's crash for a beer. Come on.
like just let it grow and like oh, I don't want to. Solace too. It's funny when Solace <laughs> lets his grow. You know, I get like I, I don't get long hair like you. I just get like poofy. poofy hair. Yeah, so <laughs> that my head too. triples in size. <laughs> man, <laughs> the thing about long hair is you have to make a commitment, man. Like everybody goes to a bad hair phase. Of course, of course, of course. And you have to like, like I know my hair looks like shit. I'm going through a bad hair phase. I'm waiting like, <laughs> like, long. Like, yeah, fuck even the girls. Like I had a friend. She shaved her head for like had it for like shape like a year. Yeah. Oh, look at this cloud. So yeah, this is me trying to get into more into video. This is just some climbing trip with some friends that's very ordinary and like was not a, a job in, its, in itself. But still, you can see more of the same storytelling. You get the reference shot and sometimes you can use some, some or hide some of this information to give different feelings. When we're talking in, in video, for instance, the whole first part of it, when we're just inside the car, uh, and most of it by, by night, it just gives you more claustrophobic, uncertain feeling until you hit the party. And this is like, and uh, that was so, so much fun. And, and I also wanted to, re regarding the story being told, I wanted to get more than just the climbing part of it because, yeah, that's beautiful and, and some ride, the sport. But for me, it's more about the interaction with people, and about how these guys we are from the States are uh, meeting us, uh, like the other guy, and me that are from Ecuador to go to, into a rock climbing, and then we bump into these people that be in the same country with completely different lifestyles, and these people live literally in the middle of nowhere. You, sorry, you saw the road, how it was to get, to, to get there. And then I think that adds to the rock climbing experience beyond the rock climbing. It's, it tells a bit more of the tale. And I don't, uh, I'm sure you noticed that whenever we do video, there are other things to consider. And the shots are just not static anymore, so we have to think of the continuity of them. And audio is essential. And this was before I had the microphone, so the audio is not the best. But then again, there's not much conversation going on, so it's not really a biggie. And but even in the edition, you can feel how audio is being considered. For instance, normally, or nobody wants to hear the autofocus mechanism on your camera. But I left it on purpose because the place was so calm that it make, made a difference. It's another level of story to see if this is so calm, you can hear the camera autofocus. There's, there's no other sound there. So, that's, a, that's just that element to consider all the time, which is the audio. And when are you going to have it there, and when are you going to skip it? Um, for instance, the rock climbing song was more uplifting, uh, common uh, ground like for, somebody, for, for young people, outdoorsy people, whereas the end is very localish sound, uh, the, 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 Andean, the Andean flute, you know. So it's, it's, it's a way to add another level of dim dimension to the story uh, uh, you're telling. And I know I've talked most of travel, and travel is something you tend to consider that it's outside. But in the end, travel is just a word for documenting, like travel photography is for documenting what we do. Uh, travel can be anything. You can travel within your own neighborhood. You can visit different places, or even visit the same places with a different mentality towards it. And so I, I saw that, that that's very extreme. But this next one was shot um, just on a, coffee, on a cafeteria with a friend just having coffee. And it's very simple.
So yeah, that's like, I mean, you don't, you don't need to go that far to, to, to do something like that. It's fairly simple, it's fairly effective, I think. And it's the same, you see, you, you had this environmental shot, more or less, where we are, there's a cafeteria and the place, what's happening here. Um, she's riding, she's taking a coffee after rolling up a cigarette, and, and you have all these small details, and you compose, and, and you create the story. And so that's, that, I would think, is the biggest difference between video and photography, which I said I was going to talk about uh, some video as well. I mean, it's, you just have to think of it as in time, the action. And sometimes it's a bit easier to do it because you don't have to uh, make a whole message in one image. You have more time. But then again, it's, it's, that's, it's hard in the same way that you have more time and you have to make it entertaining. Uh, but video-wise, there are a few tips I can, I can give. And one I already mentioned, which is the audio. Super important. In this video, for instance, the rain is just stock rain. Uh, sound, yeah, I was not recording the rain. This, this is a shot a few years ago. These are all um, non-commercial things. That's why I have just music and it's, it's, I, hope I don't get the right thing. I mean, like this is just for me and friends and family. Uh, but now I use this service called Artlist, which is it's very good for for getting the audio, the, the music to your to your films. You you I think they not they do not sponsor me, but I've used their service a few times and it's good and it's fairly cheap and you I think you pay two hundred a year and you get unrestricted use of their songs and you can choose them by topic if you want like cinematic stuff and you get but cinematic and sad, sad, and then so it sorts by moods, which is fairly easy because we, we try to deal with emotions whenever we, we, we make a film or um, photo or something. So that and a tripod is a very good idea. Uh, we all had seen family videos, and back in the day it was harder when you had the big camcorder and you were like, yeah, let me see you, and, and it's so hard to, 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 to and they, don't, they don't have the electric stabilizer and, and they do now. But still, it's, it's a good idea to frame your shot, to, to think of it before, even, before you shoot. It's the same in photography. If you compose a nice image and just wait for the action to happen, the same can be applied into video as well. And of course, there are times where you'll need to handheld some stuff, but everything should be used with a purpose. Are we hand holding? Why? Why do we need? Because this shake will create a feeling. Uh, like, and you saw in the, in, in the video, the rock climbing, there was lots of shake because I, I, I was there just wearing the minimum. So I didn't have the tripod. It was, we were very cramped in the small space uh, between the trees and the, and the wall. So I was using mostly a wide angle, which helps with the shake because you have more views, so the shake is relatively smaller. I mean, where you have a telly, you all know that. And, and that, but. Uh, when, when, when I have to shake, you can tell that there's action going on. People are taking stuff, putting them down, so it doesn't affect. If I was trying to, I don't know, maybe shot a very solemn moment and I'm shaking, it will disturb complete the, the action completely. Let's say we're shooting a funeral scene and I'm shaking everything. That doesn't, doesn't make sense. So maybe, maybe if I'm a discotheque, I'm shooting a dance scene, it maybe doesn't make much sense to have a very steady shot. Then again, creativity is not linear, so there are ways in which every shot can be made work into different scenarios. But as a rule of thumb, I will go for those. And I think the most important advice is to enjoy what you do. And yeah, whereas, yeah, it's hanging from a cliff, just meeting with people and getting naked in Antarctica. <laughs> and yes, and that. So this is. And also be grateful, be, great, be grateful because traveling is not something that everybody can do. Most people say they want to, but it's not as easy as it sounds. It, it really takes a toll on you and on, on your body and on the things you leave behind as well. You know, like, you, you, I mean, I, 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 my trips are, tend to be very long, so I, I still have my grandparents. And every time I, I leave, like, okay, is this the last time I'm going to see them? Uh, so it, it takes a toll on some person. Like everything is in 
financial sense, opportunity cost, so you get you trade things. But still, it's a blessing to be, and uh, I mean not in a religious way at all. It's just such, such a gift to be able to learn from people from so many cultures, backgrounds, experiences, and and for me, I think it's kind of a duty also to share it, what, what I've been taught along this process. Uh, it would be too much of an ego to say, I've been learning, because it's mostly things that are shown to you. Like, and it's very, 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 very humbling and very interesting. So as an end, I will show you a video I made recently to thank the people that have joined me and also to showcase what I do and what I love doing, which is this one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a few quotes I wanted to see. Um, the, this, everybody knows, I think, who Dorothea Lange is. And she said, like, this is probably the most quoted quote of photography, I think. It's the camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. And the other one is this writer I found, which is, I'm not the same, having seen the moonshine on the other side of the world. And though they come from very different uh, backgrounds, so I was talking about photography and, and, and the other one is talking about or the personal side, they, they, they both talk, I think, about the same, is the perspective change and how you let the things from the outside uh, affect you and how, how you let traveling affect you. One consciously trying to alt, alt, uh, affect, uh, alternate your perspective, with, which is the camera, and the other one, which is with your actions and venturing into the unknown. And I think, um, yeah, everything will affect you the, as much as you let it affect you. And this will not be only reflected in your photography or video work, but in pretty much every aspect of your life. So that's it. Just before I leave, I, for anybody that's interested, whether here or people that's seen on social media, I made a, a discount code um, for for my store, which will help me travel, so. <laughs> and bring more photos. And yeah, this is Enrique at B&H. Um, yeah, it's 20% discount on all the store things, so do check, do check it out. I mean, worst case scenario, you will just see some hopefully good photos. And that's it.